All right. And uh, so now an, another filled in talk. Um, uh, Eric DeGuili will be talking um, all about statistical physics of generative grammars. The floor is yours, Eric. And do you want me to um, uh, give you a, uh, a comment when you are getting to any particular moment in time or I think you're good to go? Uh, if you just gesture in the video, then I'll I'll try to catch that. Okay, we'll do. Okay, thanks. So thanks, David, for the introduction. Uh, I can't see myself. Let's see. No, can you see I my video? See, oh, no. I can't see go. you either. Uh, one second. There we go. There we go. You OK, yeah. so thanks, David, for the for the invitation to speak. So uh, first, let, let me preface my, my talk by saying that I'm coming from the background of disordered systems. I was studying glass and related things like that and got interested in, in computation in a broad sense which led me to the what I'll tell you about today. So there's a little bit of difference in um, philosophy, I think, from some of the stuff that's being done in, in stochastic thermodynamics, but I'll try to motivate my approach as I go. Okay, so the, the motivation for me to start thinking about grammars and language and so on was that the way we understand complexity in, in physics and in models that we can really solve completely is mainly at least colored by my background uh, through the spin glass and the mean field spin glass. And in that um, in that model, complexity is essentially synonymous for having many metastable states. So there's many properties that go along with having many, many metastable states. And that's essentially what we think of as being complexity. And at a technical level, when we have systems like the spin glass that are complex, this complexity is uh, signaled by so-called replica symmetry breaking in what is essentially an equilibrium partition function. And so there's a whole formalism going um, along with that that's been applied to, to glasses, to random ecosystems, lockable theorem model and related models, to the hot field model of associative memory, to neural networks uh, and so on. So that was a program that started in the eighties and has been continuing to the present day. And the question I asked myself was, is this the relevant paradigm to understand complexity uh, in language? and language in a broad sense. So the languages could be computer, human languages, computer languages, but also the biological type of the genetic language, the, the protein language, and so on. And the formalism that I'm going to use to, to, to think about this is that of generative grammars. So there is a formalism that was developed to, to quantify uh, syntactic structure in language, starting from Chomsky in the 50s. And the main idea is that Behind every language, there's a set of rules that govern the syntactic structure. So I think it's easiest to present by way of an example. So on the left, we see a sentence in English, the bear walked into the cave. And according to, to this Chomskyan paradigm, that uh, associated with that sentence is a unique tree and that you, that you can see that's hidden. And the structure of that tree encodes the syntactic structure of that sentence. And so more precisely, uh, on the nodes of the tree are, are variables, and they are um, they're hidden symbols, and they what they correspond to for language, for human language, for phrase structure, are abstract categories. So you can see things like noun and verb, and then higher level things like noun phrase and verb phrase. And so the way that it goes is that uh, there are supposed to be rules that tell you for a given language, say English, that uh, a sentence can be composed of a noun phrase and a verb phrase in that order. So that would be one rule. Can you see my cursor as I move it? Uh, one rule. Yes, we can. Yep. OK. And so there would be, a, according to the, the Stromsky paradigm, a set of rules for English that tell you how to form all well-formed sentences. And the key point is that a grammar typically generates an infinite set of, of sentences. So it's a highly compact way of quantifying structure. And so from the point of view of, of computing, information, processing, and so on, it's uh, it's something that should be very efficient, okay, if, if, if it's appropriate to the problem at hand. Okay, and now let me be a little bit, that was one example, but the, the whole structure is quite broad. And in fact, it even goes back to Panini, who was studying Sanskrit a long time ago. So a bit more generally, the way we can think of a grammar is as a set of string rewriting rules. So there's always these two sets of symbols, the hidden ones and the observable ones. Uh, 
And in general, what we do is we begin with the start symbol, and we're allowed to apply the rules repeatedly until we get only uh, observables. So for example, a simple grammar is one that has these three rules and only these three rules. And we're allowed to apply the rules in any order, starting from, from S. So for example, here's what is called a derivation that's written out uh, um, just as a line of text. S becomes SS, becomes this, and so on. And the, the end string, A, A, B, B, A, B. If instead of A, I write a left parenthesis, and instead of B, I write a right parenthesis, then you can see this is equivalent to this. And you can easily convince yourself that what this grammar does is generate all well-formed sets of parentheses, which is clearly an infinite set. So it's a very compact way to generate this um, infinite set. And, and, and in particular, infinite set that's that's not so trivial. It's uh, sets of, of well-formed parentheses are equivalent to trees. So this is actually generating all possible trees. And in general, we, we call the language as the set of observable strings generated by a given grammar. Okay. So uh, the whole formalism is quite quite vast, and accordingly, depending on how uh, uh, what you allow for the grammar, then there's different uh, classes of of um, possibilities that can, that can result. So there's the, the so-called Chomsky hierarchy that that uh, classifies those. So starting from the simplest types of grammars, which are the regular grammars, one gets up to the context-free grammars, and then more complicated ones, context-sensitive, recursively enumerable. And there are different ways to think about um, these different types of grammars. So I'll, I'll show you graphically them a bit later. But uh, from the point of view of computing, you can ask, for example, for a given class of languages, how complex of a computer do I need to be able to parse uh, strings from that language? That is, so parsing, what it means, you, you, you're taking the, the string observables of text and building that derivation, which could be a tree or some other structure. And so, for a regular language, what you need is a finite state automaton to, to parse it. So a finite state automaton is a computer. It goes through finally different states. It has no memory. It just reads a symbol and changes its internal state. For a context-free grammar, which are the ones that generate trees as derivations, you need an automaton that has a stack memory. So a stack is a memory that you can keep adding things onto, but you can only call from the top. and then the more complicated languages require um, memories that are that are um, addressable anywhere, and then potentially infinite memory. Okay. And uh, the way that I think that is actually easiest to understand the different the distinction between the different languages is by considering the, the structure of their derivation. So for a regular grammar, the, st the structure is essentially linear. So the hidden symbols are going through a Markov process. And as they go through a Markov process, they're emitting some observable symbols. So this is accordingly called a hidden Markov model. And although it seems uh, almost trivial, they are quite useful. So if you call grep in your Linux machine, the what grep takes as an argument is the regular language. So it can um, read regular languages. Um, when these things are made stochastic, then they're used quite a lot in, in bioinformatics and also in, uh, in neuroscience, as I'll talk a bit about later. Then the next step level up in the Chomsky hierarchy are the context-free grammars that generate uh, trees as their derivation structures. And this is the, the class that's played the most important role historically in, in linguistics for phrase structure, but also in computer science. So uh, since this is about computing, another, another way to think about grammars, derivations, and so on, is that when you give your code to a compiler, what the compiler is doing is it's building this derivation structure, which is the thing that is natural to translate into machine code. So when a code is, when a compiler is compiling your code, that's what it's basically doing is, is building one of these trees, okay? And then, okay, there, there are more complicated grammars and their derivation structures will not be trees anymore. They'll be more complicated graphs with loops. But um, let me just skip over that for now. Okay, so these grammars have been studied uh, since the 60s, quite intensively in the 60s, in the 70s, and a bit less so now. So there's certain classical questions one can ask. So uh, as a forward problem, you can ask, okay, if I have a given grammar, what's the language that it's produced? So what's the set of all the strings that can be produced? <clears throat> 
Or one can ask for a parsing problem. So given a grammar, um, what is the, the, the best algorithm to parse text? So there are multiple algorithms in general. And a bit more generally, as an inverse problem, you could be given a lot of text and ask what, what grammar could produce it. And so although much is known, there are algorithms to do all these things. And in some cases, so for example, for regular grammars, then there's kind of like best, we have, we know everything more or less well, from the algorithmic side. For the more complicated grammars, then things are still being studied to, to get better and better algorithms and so on. Um, but little is known about the typical case. So there's more physics type questions one can ask. So for example, as a, from a forward problem, so how complex is a typical language? And that's the kind of thing we would like to measure using quantities from information theory, entropy, and so on. Um, for parsing, then one can ask about computing resources, like how much heat is produced to, to parse um, text from a certain grammar. And inverse problems, so, it, so suppose we get some alien signal, uh, how much text will we need to decipher it? That's, that's a question that you'd have to ask about assuming some kind of typicality of the, of the language. And today, what I'll focus on is just this first question here, how complex is a typical language? Okay, so I'm going to focus on context-free grammars that generate trees. The reason is that, okay, they are the most important class for human languages and computer languages, but also they're the simplest class that can produce text with long-range correlations. So it's quite interesting from that point of view, from the point of view of physics. Okay, so you can have in mind a kind of tree like I have, like I drew already. So suppose that every rule, so this is the, the way I'm going to define my model. Suppose that every rule that we have is associated with some energy, so V, A, B, C, that has to be accounted for every time we use it. So then any derivation, so an entire tree like this, um, to get, we'll have an energy associated with that just by adding up all the rules that are used. So pi A, B, C is the number of times um, the rule A becomes B, C is used in the derivation specified by sigma. So sigma is like encoding all the hidden symbols on the graph. And I should say that I'll be considering context-free grammars. For context-free grammars, it's enough to have rules for the branching of the trees, so the, the rules of the interior of the trees. There's also a whole set of parallel things happening at the leaves. I'm mostly not going to write that just because for brevity, but you should think that um, for everything that's happening in the interior, there's some corresponding quantity at the surface. Okay, so th this is a stochastic formulation. For every possible derivation, I assign some energy. And it, the, the cheaper rules are the ones that tend to get used more frequently. And overall, the derivations that have a lower energy are the ones that are more grammatical in this uh, framework. And so a, a deterministic limit is obtained by sending some of these um, or many of these V, A, B, C to infinity such that those particular branchings never happen. Okay. And my, my model is going to be a, a talking parrot and more, even more precisely a more ridiculously uh, equilibrium talking parrot. So it's uh, a device that is sampling sentences of some typical length for a given grammar and in contact with the heat bath. So I have a whole equilibrium set up here. So uh, this is not the way I originally presented the, the model. At the time, I was not really thinking of a specific physical instantiation, but it's equivalent. What, what I did is totally equivalent to considering this. So the point is that the parrot is just talking, but it's not, there's no real input. It's just talking. It's sampling from this distribution from the grammar that it has. And so we have then the whole apparatus of equilibrium stat mech that can be applied. And so one can ask, for example, what is the typical energy, which is the typical cost of producing a sentence at a certain length from this grammar and so on. And now the interesting regime is when we have, or presenting, constructing long text. So that could be one long sentence, or it could be many long sentences together. And in principle, observables like this expected energy depend on all the details of the grammar. But uh, as elsewhere in physics, we expect universality to hold. So more precisely, we expect that the right observables will be self-averaging in the sense that they don't depend on all details of the grammar in the limit where L goes to infinity. And so what that motivates then is an ensemble approach that instead of trying to compute things for one grammar, which is hard, we can try to compute things over an ensemble of grammars, which then defines what, what I call the random language model. And then the simplest model for my ensemble of grammars is just to let these energies 
be Gaussian IAD. So then there's a certain mean value, V bar, and uh, some fluctuations uh, quantified by this um, quantity epsilon. So it, it turns out that for context free grammars, this V bar just controls the size of the tree. So I'm, I'm going to tune it to get large trees. So that's just because I want to consider th this limit of large trees. And so this epsilon will be the essential parameter controlling the variance of the rule en energies. So th the way to think about it is that when epsilon is large, this variance is small. It means that basically all derivations will have the same energy. So there's no discriminating factor between what's grammatical and what's ungrammatical. And we'll just be battling in that, in that sense. Whereas when epsilon is small, the different, different rules have strongly different energies, which means that the different derivations will have much different probabilities. And which allows then syntactic rules to be followed very rigidly. Okay, now, as usual, when we have any kind of equilibrium problem, what matters in the Boltzmann factors are not energies per se, but the energies times inverse temperatures, beta. And so the dimensionless control parameters are uh, beta times this V bar and also beta squared over, over epsilon. And again, V bar is just controlling the size of the trees. So the essential parameter is this one here. And so lowering the physical temperature is increasing beta, which is lowering epsilon. So T and epsilon play the same role, which is why I called epsilon a temperature in my paper. Now, for historical reasons, I, I chose to actually fix beta equals one and then use epsilon as the control parameter, but you can just think of it as the equivalent to controlling the physical temperature if, if you prefer. And so what happens, so there, there are two essential control parameters. So the first, there's epsilon that I just mentioned. There's also n, which is just the number of hidden symbols, which is some, some measure of the maximal complexity of the language that you can have. And so what I'm showing you now are results, numerical results, for the Shannon entropy of the derivations. And more precisely, this is the Shannon entropy of the interior part of the derivations, the, the interior part of the trees. And th there's a ver variety of curves here because I've, I've done numerics at different values of n, so different numbers of hidden symbols. And uh, numerically, I'm measuring the entropy of, of like phrases. So k equals one, that's when I'm, it's just the en entropy of single words. k equals two is for pairs of words, also called bigrams. K equals three is, is three words in a row and so on. And the main point is that all of these entropies are near their maximal value above some certain temperature. So that means that the derivations are just uniform random noise. But as I lower the temperature below some critical value, they all start to drop quite precipitously. And as I increase K, they drops more strongly. So what, what's really interest, of interest is when K goes to infinity, but that's numerically challenging to compute but we expect it to drop quite a lot here. And the interior, the, the, this Shannon entropy of the interior of the trees is not exactly the thing we care about the most. We care about the, the actual language that's produced. And so that has its own Shannon entropy. And the story is similar, it's less dramatic, but um, these entropies are, are flat above some, above this characteristic temperature and then they start to, to drop and they, they drop more for longer phrases. So. Overall, what we're seeing is the emergence of structure, and it's I call it deep structure. That's just meaning that it's corresponding to the interior of the trees at some characteristic mm. uh, temperature. And one can understand this scaling here, where this comes from, by, by asking, okay, for a given length of, of text, what's the entropy, the Boltzmann entropy of trees? So how many trees are there for, for a given length of text? So that's something you can easily compute. And then you can also ask for a given length, what's the typical energy? At a, at a certain temperature. And what you find is that um, this critical temperature is the one where the fluctuations in energy are of the same order as the entropy. So it's when those two things can start to compete with each other. So in other words, at higher temperatures, entropy wins. It doesn't matter that some phrases are more grammatical than others. That's basically irrelevant compared to entropy. So we just are sampling everything essentially uniformly. Whereas below this temperature, energy starts to win and you, you start to say, the parrot starts to say the grammatical things, even though there's far less of them. And one can also ask, okay, is this a real transition? Is there some symmetry that's broken at this transition and so on? And indeed uh, the permutation symmetry seems to be broken at this, at this temperature. So what that means is that I have a bunch of hidden symbols 
So I have things like noun and verb and, and so on. But in the high temperature regime, even though those are different symbols, if they're used equivalently, then there's no actual functional difference between them. So even the fact that I say one is noun and one is verb doesn't mean anything until they start to actually be used in a distinct way. And that's what's hap what happens at this transition point. So in other words, the permutation symmetry is spontaneously broken at this critical, um, critical point. And now, um, if this is a real phase transition associated to breaking of symmetry, there should be some order parameter that is, is zero above this point and non-zero below. So one can define an analogy with spin glasses, um, an order parameter, um, a spin glass type order parameter that's that's suited to, to trees. And it is indeed small above this point and grows below it. And now one last important thing on this slide is that I motivated the ensemble approach by saying that if we, even though maybe in the real world, what we care about is one grammar, if we look at large texts, we expect that not all details of the grammar actually matter. And, and that the many observables should be self-averaging. And now you see on this slide that I, I've shown error bars on the observables. So those error bars are not uh, the errors in the measurements. They're, they're rather the magnitude of fluctuations over different grammars at those parameters. So you see, for example, that for the entropies, as I increase K, those bars are getting smaller or as I increase n, the bars are getting smaller. So that suggests that in either of those limits, n goes to infinity or k goes to infinity, that the fluctuations over the entropy go to zero, which means that the quantity is self-averaging. So in other words, at, at a given epsilon and n, the, the entropy is uniquely fixed, independent of the grammar. And that's very useful because it means, for example, if I, if I measure the entropy and I know the number of hidden symbols, then I can infer what is the temperature of that grammar just by um, going across on this curve. And then the, the Q2, likewise, um, the error bars get smaller as I increase n. OK. So that, in a sense, vindicates the, the, the ensemble approach by showing that, at least for these observables, things appear to be self-averaging, although uh, one can do things much more carefully with larger, more statistics and so on. Okay, and overall, the, this kind of picture, it suggests a simple picture of learning. So it, it was argued by Chomsky, the so-called poverty of the stimulus argument that the, the child knows something about what it's learning, that if it didn't know anything, it couldn't learn anything at all. So suppo let's suppose the child only knows that it's learning a context-free grammar. So presumably this is due to some hardware constraints. And there's a discussion about that in the neuroscience literature. Then in this picture, initially it doesn't know anything specific about the grammar. It has to be able to learn any, any language. So it would be starting at the high temperature regime. All the weights are equivalent. Then as the child is imitating its parents, its temperature necessarily decreases. So the, it's tuning the knobs of the grammar to make some things more likely than others, which will necessarily make it move to the left in that diagram I showed. And then what, what the model suggests will happen is that the output will look close to noise for a while, even though the this temperature is changing. It doesn't really affect change. Doesn't really affect the output. And then, quite suddenly, you'll cross this transition point, and you'll start to produce more grammatical sentences. And, and this is what most parents will tell you is observed that um, it's very hard to, de to detect changes in the child's syntactic ability until about um, two years of age, two to two and a half years of age when their ability starts to increase quite dramatically. And OK, this is a very qualitative picture. One would like to be more quantitative. Um, there's not that much data for real humans learning. So that's the, the key problem. Um, some things have been studied by Ricard Soleil, for example. So they showed that uh, certain you can build some graphs from human data. And there's a clustering coefficient that's, that's small below this this um, syntactic transition and large above it, large beyond it. And so we could show that in our model, the same thing happened so that the, the transition seems to be synonymous. But again, the data is quite noisy. So it's hard to make definitive conclusions from that. Okay, now, going back to my initial motivation for this problem, uh, I initially hoped that this model would be solvable in the sense of, uh, Stat mag that we can compute the partition function to understand the phase structure and so on. 
Um, this is probably too ambitious, um, although one, one can develop theory to compute some things. So for example, one can develop theory to, to predict this uh, order parameter like, like uh, quantity Q2 at, at high temperature. And so the, the black curves here are the, are the theoretical prediction without fitting parameters that match the data perfectly. So okay, down here, this is just some sampling artifact that's totally understood, but they, they track the data um, very well uh, above this transition, then they do something else. And work is ongoing at the lower temperature regime to understand what happens. And then, okay, one, one, when one faces a model that's that's not solvable, then the natural thing is to look for simpler models, but it's hard to make a simpler model that has the phenomenon. So you can make simpler models, but they have no transition. They just produce noise all the time. Basically, you need a large dynamic range to get anything interesting to get low entropy, but then that makes the model hard to solve. And then, okay, I focused on this forward problem of just asking how complex languages are and so on, but there are the other problems that I mentioned. So for example, the inverse problem of alien language inference, that's quite interesting and actually somewhat doable. So that's, I've worked on that sporadically, but I haven't published that yet. And now, um, Again, when something is too complicated, you should go to back to a simpler model. So I also looked at, at uh, the regular grammar case, which I initially thought would be would be trivial. It turns out to be pretty interesting. So you can write down a very analogous model for regular grammars, which in the stochastic case are hidden markup models. It has a similar transition, so the entropy drops not, not quite so dramatically, but still um, drops at a characteristic epsilon. And what I like about this, this case is that you can understand what's going on from random matrix theory. So not totally quantitatively, but you can place the transition point and so on. And moreover, that for the case of Markov chains, there's a measure of complexity, the predictive information from Bialik and others. And this seems to peak near this transition point, which is pretty interesting. So it means that when epsilon is high, so what this predictive information measures is, if I know the past, how well can I predict the future? And how well, meaning how much information is there to, to predict about the future. So the point is that when epsilon is large, everything is just noise, so there's nothing to predict. Whereas when epsilon is really small, the, the dynamics is very deterministic. So again, there's not that much to predict, even though it's quite predictable. And it's in the intermediate regime where the dynamics is sufficiently complex that there's a lot to predict. Um, a lot to predict there, okay. and. There's more data out there for Markov models than for, for context-free ones. So in particular, we had a look at fMRI data that had pre previously been um, modeled as a hidden Markov model by neuro neuroscientists. And we can measure the various things in our theory. And what's interesting is that we showed that the over a variety of human subjects, like 800 hu human subjects, their predicted epsilon was very close to this, um, got it. This, this critical value. And moreover, we could quantitatively predict the values of entropy and other quantities uh, from that. So it's a very, it's a null model, but it turns out to be um, work out quite well when you have Markov models. And what we're doing now on this model is trying to understand the effect of, the explicit effect of matrix asymmetry to connect with things studied in stochastic thermodynamics like entropy production and so on. Okay, and again, going more towards stochastic thermodynamics. So my approach was essentially an equilibrium approach. I was just thinking about typical properties of grammars, but one can try to make it dynamic by choosing a direction of time. So for regular grammars, that's already built in, that's obvious. But for CFGs, for context-free grammars, there are different ways to make the time go. You can have it coming from the root of the tree downwards or from the left to the right and so on. And so there's different ways to set up the problem and probably should be informed by some particular application of something that's running grammars. But that would allow a stronger connection to thermodynamics. So let me uh, conclude there that uh, generative grammars are a formalism to encode syntactic structure in a very broad sense. So I talked about it here for uh, structure of, of languages, of strings. There, there are also things called shape grammars and so on that I'm not so familiar with. Uh, Context-free grammars in particular are a simple model with quite non-trivial properties. They can have long-range correlations and so on. And once one has an ensemble of grammars that defines what I call the random language model, that seems to have some spin glass transition. There's a bit of debate about whether it's a true transition or not, but in any case, the numerical results are quite clear. And 
the stat mech problem, the analytical side of it is not trivial, not totally intractable, somewhere in between. And this is a thread of work I started when I was a postdoc in Paris. So let me thank um, my colleagues there, Remy Monasson, Hori Kirchan, Francesco Zempelonigi, and Sermergian, Pierre Francesco Agani, and also Giorgio, who I was talking to. So and with that, I'll end here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Eric. Um, so there was one thread going on in the chat. Um, I think it's mostly been resolved. Um, are there any other questions that people have? Peter Werner, so if you could make it, anybody else? If not, oops, we're having several. Um, okay, if you guys could make it a little bit quick then, given that we're already a little bit over time. Peter, you were um, first up. Peter, go ahead. Um, we neither see nor hear you. Dahlia, do you want to go while Peter is trying to do anything yes. yes, thank you, please. Uh, so, uh... Thank you very much. Very, very nice talk. Very nice uh, research uh, done by you. Uh, so you consider context-free grammar, uh, and uh, you do not consider probabilistic context-free grammar when you associate probability to every rule. Uh, I didn't catch exactly what you're saying, but I, I think the question so is- Do, do, do you it. consider uh, context deterministic context-free grammars or probabilistic context-free grammars? They're probabilistic because for the deterministic oh. case, the energy would be zero or infinite, like a kind oh. of hardcore potential. Oh, but okay. if the energy is taking real values, then it's, it's stochastic. And if, okay. at low temperature, the range of energies is very wide, so it becomes closer to a deterministic case, but it's, it's on the continuum. Okay. Yes. Okay. And uh, just uh, to ask about this scaling, you have a log to n epsilon on the x axis, and you have uh, entropy over log n on y axis. Why do we have this log square, and how this scaling affects the whole anomaly? So okay, for the y-axis, the scaling is quite natural because there's a maximum value that a Shannon entropy can take yeah. over n variables, right? So that's scaled so that this is clear near one at high temperature. Then, okay, the, the, the scaling that I did here, I just wanted to collapse the different data. So that's more or less an empirical scaling, but you can derive this scaling by, um, by asking about the, the typical size of energy and so on. So, mm -hmm. um, I don't have any intuition for why it's log square, but you can just do the math and you can see that it comes out. It's not it's not complicated. Uh, I, I don't have any deep reason why it's log square. Yeah. Okay, thank okay. you very much. Um, Peter, we can neither see nor hear you. And um, so he's got a question. And then if you could just answer this very, very quick, Eric, it's in the chat. Um, and then we'll move on to Michael. So. Um, the question is, why is the partition function difficult to compute, Eric? Uh, it's it's because the energy for a given grammar, the um, like that it's it's like like any it's like it's kind of like a spin glass. You you have uh, an energy for each rule, so to figure out the um, all possible configurations that have low energy that's it's not so simple to to do um it, it looks more or less like a spin glass uh, there's a, some some differences but they the structure of the problem is is similar to uh to spin glass spin glass on a tree in fact okay so we might so at this point i think that any further follow-up to any of those questions on of course i'm particularly intrigued by the stochastic thermodynamics angle on it of making this be a dynamic model rather than equilibrium. Um, but in any case, I think at this point, um, thank Eric. And the uh, concluding 